Are we having children's church this morning? I, I know somebody announced that if they were taking the place of Sammy, they could. If not, we'll stay. I'll just leave it up to you. Um, I don't know if you listened to the words of that song. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm asking this morning real, real quickly and briefly, what do we know about holiness? Because we've had a glimpse of it. Uh, the moment we were saved, and, and rightfully so, the moment that we were introduced to Jesus and He introduced Himself to us, and many of us boldly accepted that, and it's transformed our life. But there's a multitude of us here this morning. Uh, maybe they'll listen by CD. Maybe they're our neighbors or co-workers. And we're proclaiming the name of Jesus, and we don't even understand what holiness is. Because we brought baggage with us and that's what God wants right and we, we leave with baggage and that's not what He wants and we're living this life and, and we're proclaiming the name of Christ and holiness and purity and we're living a life of, and I think we summed it up in Sunday school, it's called sin but it's garbage. <laughs> and we're just spewing a bunch of garbage out to the world and wondering why the world's not changed and not following Christ because we don't even understand what holiness is. And there's a responsibility on our part to be an example of holiness to a lost and dying world. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, I want to encourage you, uh, maybe you shouldn't be looking at us. If we're the ones spewing garbage, please don't, don't check us out. But there's a few of us here that get us, and I would encourage you to find who those people are and just tag along with them. And you're going to see that Jesus can truly transform your life. And He can change it, not based on my authority, but based on the authority of His Word. Now, I've been convicted recently, and it's just like God is just dealing with me in, in so many ways, in so many fronts. And I was looking at, at this year, and, and this is a brief moment and a glimpse of this year. Amen? <laughs> I mean, I'm looking, it's January 20th. I mean, I'm not even three weeks. I'm that three weeks into this thing, and... I jotted this word down yesterday. I was just, just kind of walking through the house. And I'm a thinker anyway. Uh, that's that's kind of what I do. And I pace and I think. And uh, my wife doesn't like that, by the way. <laughs> All that pacing and thinking. And I wrote this word down. And I wrote down whirlwind. And it seems like the, the new year has been a whirlwind so far. It's just been so quick. And, and for a lot of us, we've had that whirlwind, and it's been good, and it's been bad, and it's been uh, rumors of things that could happen and things that didn't happen, and God comes in and intervenes and all this. But it's a whirlwind. And I said, Lord, what does the word whirlwind even mean? And, and I began to look it up because I, I like that. And here's what it says. It's a column of wind. It's a disturbance. And it says there's two types of whirlwinds. I said, Lord, what kind of whirlwind would I be in? And it says one lasts longer. And, and this type of whirlwind is called a major whirlwind. And they're hard to interrupt. When this whirlwind comes, it's a tornado. And nothing in its way is really going to stop it. As a matter of fact, that whirlwind will destroy anything in its path. But they said there's something else that you can, you can experience, and it's a minor whirlwind. Like, that's, that's really thinking things through, right? Major and minor. I thought, wow. And it says that these minor whirlwinds are things that are shorter, and, and actually it can be interrupted by obstructions or things in its path. And all of us this morning are, are facing some type of whirlwind. Some of it's going to be major and nothing's going to stop it, right? And, and we're facing it and we don't understand. But a majority of us, if not all of us, have these minor ones too that are being thrown at us. And, and things will stop it. There's a, there's a path where it will end and, and, and something will obstruct it and push it somewhere else. Now we've, we've had a whirlwind. Uh, it seems like in my mind, emotionally, spiritually, for this new year, it just seems like a whirlwind. I'm not going to magnify it. I told Sam, I'm not going to magnify things. I'm not going to push it under the rug either. I'm just going to accept what, what we have, and, and I'm going to go forward. And I, I want to thank you as a church and a body of believers um, for those who would pray for us and visit us and call us. And, and listen, I'm going to throw this out because you're speaking loudly to me. I'm talking about the amount of food that came to the house. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I said, now, this is good. <laughs> And, and, and all week I've been battling this desire for this food and the magnitude of the whirlwind. 
because I'm seeing some good, right? I'm like, man. And, and, and maybe you're here and you say, man, I hadn't prayed for you. That's cool too. Maybe I hadn't prayed for you and <laughs> maybe we're even, right? But we can start now. We can pray for each other. And, I, and by the way, if you hadn't brought food, I'll be home all next week. I mean, <laughs> every evening. I'm joking. I'm joking. But I said, I'm trying to battle this thing, right? Because God's always pouring out this goodness. Uh, and maybe I don't always want to see it or hear from it. Those are whirlwinds, right? I want you to keep that in mind. I told Hope when she said, Chad, I got three songs. I can't decide on two. I said, sing all three. <laughs> sing all three. Because I'm convinced that they're not going to zip the Bibles up on you. They're going to zip it up on me. Amen. <laughs> they're looking at me. I'm on the clock, not you. You just sing your song. If you've been here the last couple weeks, you've seen us talk about different things in the Bible. Uh, in particular, we've been at the house of Simon the leper, and we've been looking at Mary and Martha. Uh, we've been looking at Lazarus. Remember, he was there last week according to one gospel account. And, uh, and in particular, Jesus is there, and he, he, he's over everything, right? I mean, he, he's the reason they were preparing this dinner. And we looked at a couple things. We looked at obedience. Uh, we looked at enthusiasm. We've been talking about making changes in our life, and I, I encourage you to make those changes. Uh, some of you, if you're like me, I feel like uh, I'm January 20th, and I have just fallen flat on my face at some of these spiritual changes that I want to make. Uh, but it doesn't stop. I mean, we've got to pick ourselves up, right? And, and we've got to go forward uh, with the changes that we expect to make spiritually in our life so that we can get a glimpse of what holiness really is. Right? It's like getting on that horse, right? When that horse throws you off, you've got to get back on and you've got to keep going. At least that's what they say. Is that, is that true? I don't know. That's what my dad always said. Yeah, we, we bought a horse when we first got married. And, um, boy, I don't, I'm not a cowboy. And that thing threw me off the horse and it drove my tailbone up through my skull it seemed like and uh, seriously I was checking I thought oh it came out but uh, my dad said get on that horse again boy <laughs> yeah yeah I'll do that dad <laughs> I'll do that and uh, he's real forceful you know my dad he, he really pushed that and I got back on that horse and I, I thought about that I said spiritually is that not our life I mean, sometimes we, we're, not, we're not cowboys, right? Sometimes we're not, we're not spiritual folk. Well, we really don't understand holiness, and we don't understand what it means to be spiritual. And we've been saved by grace, and we're thrown into this arena of, of being spiritual and Christ-like, and a lot of times we just get thrown. And, and unfortunately, a lot of us as Christians, when we're thrown, we just lay there. And we don't get back up. And if we do get back up, we get on the sideline. And, and I like those people that, that really get it. And when they're thrown spiritually, they get back up and they get right back on that thing. And they say, you know what? It's absolutely worth it, uh, what I've experienced in Christ. So we're talking about making changes in our life. And I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. If there's any sermon I could ever preach... It, it, uh, this is, this, is, this is the one. I want you to really think about this this morning. This is, the, this is a passage that's really going to challenge us. It's challenged me. It's really making me think. Um, it's putting things in a different perspective. And really, that's what God's Word should do. Amen? And it really should. And unfortunately, and I just want to share this with you, because here's what's happening to us. And we're kind of spoiled people, and I understand that, because uh, that, that's how we're raised. That's our society, culture. Uh, we, we want to hear God's word, but we want to be taught and we want to be fed and we show up and we want all those things. But I want to encourage you this morning that that's, that's cheap. <laughs> that's, that's an easy way out. Because really what's going to make a difference in your life and my life is when we go home and we're alone with the Lord. It's when we're alone and we're reading his word. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm, I, it's important to come out and I know that and, and, and I want you to and, and I want us to worship and... Um, but if that's all we're doing, let's be honest. And I'm talking about myself, and you know they always say if the shoe fits, right? Uh, and I want you to look at yourself. Uh, if that's all we're doing, shame on us. Shame on us because it's, it's not impacting our life like it should. And I, I'm convinced that it's not because you look at our society. And there's people who are standing up for Christ that are standing up for, for the, the things that are not true. Because they're not changed by the Word. Because we go home and we have no alone time with the Lord. And here's the thing that's major about some alone time with the Lord that, that I find amazing because when I'm here and when you're here, uh, we can lie to each other. Amen? I mean, we're holy and we're spiritual. 
And, and if Jim says raise your hand, we know which one to raise and which one feels better. And we, we know how to close our eyes and, and we really know how to worship. And, but when we get home and we're alone with God, and by the way, he sees us here anyway and he knows a lot of that's you know, acting and, and, and we're just in the moment or we're just here together and we're, we're trying to do what, what feels right and what we know is right and what we really want to do. But when we get home and we just throw his word aside or we're really not spiritual or holy, uh, we can't lie to God that way. And that's what happens. And, and, and a lot of times that's why we put it down. Because if I read this alone, man, God's really going to speak to me. And sometimes it challenges us, right? Every, the way we were raised, uh, the way we thought, the way we thought we were headed, and now we're, we're looking at the, the passage and, and we're concerned. We've been talking about obedience and enthusiasm. And I want you to pay attention to these verses here this morning. We're going to start in verse 13, uh, kind of picking up there. And I want you to say these words before we get going, because I, I want this to really kind of, kind of get into your mind and your spirit today. And I want you to just repeat this after me, if you will. I mean, I always say this, humor me, right? Just repeat these words. Lasting change, lasting change. comes from lasting words. I want you to say that. I want you to write it down. I want you to get this this morning, that lasting change. Because we've been talking about making a change in our life. If you want a change that will last, that change comes from lasting words. Have you ever been given those words of wisdom or advice or something that kind of lasted with you? But over time, uh, that, that may dwindle. But here's something this morning that I think will challenge you spiritually. Uh, that the Word of God is a word that will last uh, and that is our lasting change. I want you to keep that in mind. Lasting change comes from lasting words. Uh, I'm going to pick up, uh, I said 13, but let's go ahead and pick up with 12. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, uh, though ye know them, and, and be established in the present truth. And, and here's what Peter's saying here. And you've got to kind of pick up where he is. Uh, more than likely, he's in prison, uh, and he's about to die. And, and, and I can't imagine that, knowing that, right? Like everybody's, I'd like to know, no, 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 not, not old Chad. I, I don't want to know that. And, and notice what he said here. He said, but here's the thing. I know what's coming, but I got to remind you of some things. Verse 13, yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle or as, as long as I'm alive or in this body, uh, it's, it's in me to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And, and he's saying to us and, and to these believers here that he's writing to, he says, as long as I'm alive, it's the right thing for me to do is to continue to remind you of these things I'm going to list. I am Peter and I'm about to die, but I, I'm convinced in my heart that I've got to tell you some things uh, before I leave this world. And notice verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. And he's got this revelation that he's going to die. Uh, he knows how he's going to die. He's, he's got this vision. And if anybody has a right, let's be honest, to sit on the sideline and say, you know what, I've, I've given my time, Lord. You just got to let somebody else do it. I mean, I'm in prison. That's bad enough. I'm going to die and it's, it's not going to be a pleasant death. This, this, is, this is really going to hurt. I mean, this is, this is not just painful. I'm going to be crucified uh, just like the one I'm serving, the one I'm following. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be crucified. And, and I'm not even worthy to be crucified. And he, he's going to be crucified upside down because he's not worthy to be crucified like his Savior. And he's got all these thoughts this whirlwind in his life. He's got one of those major words. Nothing's going to change this. And it's, all this is on him, but he's moved. He's moved to, to pin this, and, and he's moved to say these things. He says, before I, I leave, I've got to show you some things. Notice verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor, I'll work hard, that you'll be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Or, he, you know, he says, God's shown me. I know for a fact that my time is up. My time is over here on, on this earth. And, and there's some things I want to leave with you. And I, I just want to pause there real quickly because I want us to understand something that some of us, if we just go by the natural process of life, we're closer to the end than we are the beginning. Let's just, let's just be honest this morning, right? Some of us are holding babies, and if we just go with the natural process, they've got a long ways to go. But some of us, 
we're closer to the end than we are the beginning. And, and, and sometimes in life, we've got to start to transition to what, what am I going to leave behind? I'm, I'm not talking about what I've worked for and what I've earned. I'm talking about spiritual things this morning. What am I going to leave behind? If I look at my local church and, and I look at our, our children and our youth, am I leaving something behind other than you should and you shouldn't do this in the house of the Lord? Do you really want children and youth to remember that about you? Like, I, I come in, and, and, and this is the way I was, and, and man, that guy or gal really jumped on me. I'm, not, I'm all for uh, some guidelines, right? But I'm more for people being saved. I mean, if, and if some of us, and we got to realize that maybe we're midlife or we're young, Here's the, the reality of life. It could end this week. I just want to pause, right? My life could end this week. And I, I can't really wait till I get to a certain point to say naturally God's going to... Peter knows, right? And, and I think if there's anything that we can get right now, it's we got to understand that there's coming a point where we too will leave. And the question is, what are you moved to do uh, knowing that you're leaving? Is it to make sure things are right for your family and all the material things that really it's, it's nothing? It's, it's that garbage. Or do you want to leave something behind spiritually? And this says, I'm convinced that I'm going. I'm convinced. Peter said, I know I'm dying. I know that. But it's more important for me to do this for you. And he says, God has shown me my time is up. I, I know that. Notice what he says in verse 16. For we have not followed. No, notice what he says because I, I, he's really getting to a point here. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And he says, I want you to, to know when you read this and when it's preached and when it's taught that I did not and we did not, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths. I mean, there's a lot of things that's come through history about spiritual things, who you should follow and what teaching and what word is accurate and what Savior is real. He says, I want you to know I am Peter. I'm about to die. I'm going to be crucified upside down. If there's anyone throughout history who could change Change the story. It's me, but I choose this path because I've been changed by the king. And he says, I want you to know something. I did not, and we did not. He says the words, we, we did not follow just the latest, greatest thing that came along. I mean, it, we didn't do that. We didn't follow these myths. And, and if we look at our own society, they're going to come more... They're going to continue to come. Something new will come out. And something, a new teaching and a new thought and a, and a new way to worship will come. And all these things will come out. And he says, listen, we didn't follow all that. And it's clever, by the way. I mean, it's going to confuse you if you allow it. Because we have no idea, no glimpse of what holiness is. And he says, but I want you to know, we didn't follow that. We, we didn't do that. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He says, I saw it with my own eyes. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount he says notice this what is he referring to i mean we could take our we could go right back to matthew we're in chapter 17 they're on the mountain and he says listen i was there with jesus when his face he says just the just the glory of his face it just shone like the sun it was it was so bright i couldn't even look at him and i saw it with my own eyes what's about to come in the future. He said, I want you to know I saw that. I'm convinced, I believe. I, I know what the future holds. I'm in the living room with Connor. Looking at life, right? We're just looking at life and Connor says, I've, I've got a dream, Dan. I said, wow, that's good. What's your dream, son? It's funny how kids, he's, he's, he said, I got a dream. When I grow up, I'm going to make my own pop. <laughs> That's good. 
I said, well, that's good, honey. I, I, you got to have dreams. You got to have something to work for, right? I said, what, well, you, you're going to make a pop? He said, I'm going to make a pop. And I got a real cool name for it, Dad. I said, what's the name? He said, Mella Yella. <laughs> Mella Yella, Dad. How do, do you like that? I said, I, I like the sound of it. I, I like it. It's got a ring to it, son. I went, ooh, I, I think it could be successful, right? <laughs> I said, but I said, let me tell you something, just, just so you might be able to tweak your dream a little. <laughs> There's a pop out there called Melly Yellow. <laughs> and he sits down, and he sits down, he puts his head down, he said, well, there went all my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dreams. Now, all of us have those, right? Whether it's Melly Yellow, whether it's to be president of the company, whether it's to retire a millionaire, a billionaire, wh whatever our dreams are, and then there's Peter. And Peter says, I've got a dream. I've got a dream to write this to you even when I'm going to die. That's a whirlwind. But he says, I love you. So I, I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it when God came. I, I didn't see, but it was just beautiful. And I saw all this and, and it's, I, I just fell and trembled. I, I can't imagine that you wouldn't believe this. I saw it with my own. This is not cleverly divided. I saw it. And I am willing to die for what I saw and what I believe. I'm willing to do that. I saw all of that glory. Now, I'm thinking, if me and a few of you, uh, we went up on this mountain and we were just talking and, and my face started to glow like the sun. Is that kind of weird? I <laughs> mean... Yes, you know, some of us are like, yeah, that's, that's kind of weird, and some of us, it doesn't matter, right? But I think it's kind of weird. Like, if I was up on, and, and you're thinking you're with this guy, he's Jesus, and, and he just, he's flesh and blood. I mean, you, you, you're starting to understand, but there he is, and boom, there's, there's something different about him. Jesus. And I'm, I see him, and, and I believe this. I saw his glory. But notice what he said in verse 19. You've got to get this, right? We've also a more sure word of prophecy. And he says, of all the experience, he said, I've seen it. I saw it. I was there. I'm about to die. I'm Peter. But I have greater confidence in not my own experiences. I have greater confidence in his word. That's what he said. I'm beginning to get it. And I said, all my life spiritually, I've been looking for things that God can show me and God can do. And then I'm a believer and then I'll do more. And Peter says, I saw it with my own eyes. I, I saw this, this glow. I, I saw the, him shining and I'm here in this prison. But more than that, if you, if you read it and you think, well, it's talking about this prophecy and that prophecy. But if you really dig into it, and I was just reading over and over again, it says, if you just follow the word pattern, even in the original language, it's not talking about the, it's talking about the Word of God. And he says, you know what? But more than what I've experienced, this right here tells you the truth. It tells you the truth. And if you're only getting it here on Sunday morning, then you're not getting it. He says, listen to me, you can experience everything you can in this world that's spiritual and godly. But he said, here's what's more. I have more confidence in the Word of God than what I saw on that mountain. <laughs> that's what he said. I'm more sure word of prophecy, greater confidence, where until ye do well that you take heed. He says, it does you. You're going to do very well in your life if you pay close attention to what I'm writing, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. He says, it's more than what I saw. We have the words of the creator of the universe, and it's in most of our hands this morning. Amen. And I'm going out on a limb. Most of these hands and eyes have never read his entire word. Peter is confident. If you read this, you will be convinced that he's real. He's Christ. He's the Messiah. He says, pay close attention. Pay close attention to what I'm saying here. He's, I want you to understand what you see and, and, and what you've experienced, but more importantly, what you've read. 
verse 20, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not about an opinion. It's not about an interpretation. And have you noticed that? That when you spread God's word or you teach God's word or you preach God's word, many people will say, well, that's your interpretation of that passage. And, I, and I, I'm convinced and I read this and Peter says, that's not true. It's not your interpretation and your interpretation and your opinion on what you think it said. This is what God said. This is what he means. That's what he says. And he says, I am more confident in the word than seeing him on the mountain face to face. I'm more confident in this. He says, I want you to be confident in it. I don't want you to form an opinion or an interpretation. I just want you to be a follower of his word. That's what I want you to do. Not on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He said, I want you to go home and I want you to be alone with your creator and read his word. That's what I want you to do. I'm about to die. But it's so important for me to get this out to you. The Bible says, for the prophecy came, verse 21, not in old time, but by the will of man, or not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God's word that we hold in our hand, God's written word. It's been written over 1,500 years a span by 45 different authors, some of whom had never heard of the others, yet everyone agree on what they've written about the creator of our universe. And if we'll read it, Read it. It'll take the place of any experience you've ever had with the Lord. Remember our prayer? I mean, someone was like, yeah, I remember that. I, I think it's in my car. I, I think I threw it out the window by accident. I mean, I, and some of us maybe have it and we're, we're praying. And I would encourage that you, you pray it. But you add to it. You keep adding to it. Because there's a multitude of things to pray for, right? I've been guilty all my spiritual life of praying for experiences in the Lord. And the experiences are okay. I mean, that's what Peter said. It's okay. But here, I've got to have moments with His Word. His Word. I've got to be able to sit down and read His Word. I, I've got to be serious about change. We've talked about change in our life. We want obedience and enthusiasm. And all this change lasts when we get words that last. And these are the only words that will ever last. I mean, the experts will tell us, right? They tell us if you do something for 30 days, you're going to be three times more likely to succeed. And I would encourage you, commit to the Lord with obedience, enthusiasm, but commit to the Lord looking for lasting words. And he gave them to us. I Chad, I don't get it and I don't understand. And I, I read. I mean, I... Man, you get run out of church. I, I know that. I mean, just, just read. I mean, find something in, 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 that you get and read. Uh, read it. And when I read it, I'm telling you, I'm convicted. I'm changed because I'm not holy. That, that's kind of a bummer. Like, you kick yourself. Like, I can come to church and I can lie to you and I can do all the things that you want me to do. But I can go home and be as unrighteous and unholy. You don't want that, do you? And I don't want that from you, and we don't want that from each other, but that's how we're living. That's how we're living as followers of Christ. Yet Peter says, I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm about to be crucified. And, but I'm going to be crucified upside down. I'm going to close with this passage. We'll close with this thought. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. Notice what the Bible says, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. For all those things hath my hand made, both heaven and earth is what he's saying. My, my hands. And if you've been here about the, the potter's wheel, we're looking at the hand of, of the Father. He says, my hand, I'm God, I've made heaven and earth. And all those things have been, everything in, in the earth, everything you see is mine saith the Lord. Or he's saying, I have spoken. The Lord is speaking here. And notice what he said here. But this man will I look. This is the person I'm looking to. Even to him that's poor or humble. That's what the word means. I'm looking for a person that's humble. 
I'm looking for a person that has a contrite spirit. That's somebody who feels or expresses remorse. He says, I'm looking for that. But I am, I am looking. There's a threefold. I am also looking for the one that trembleth at my word. That's who I'm looking for. I'm not looking for those who have this mountaintop experience. I'm looking for those who are on the mountaintop that tremble at the word of God. When he spoke, this, this, is, this is Jesus. Whoa. We don't have enough respect for his word. Now, listen, we come to church. We, we want to change the world. I know that. And, and we're, we're frustrated and we're confused and we're hurt and we're angry. And, and guys, I, I just want to tell you that the, the magnifying glass is on us. <laughs> If we went around the room and God just said, I'm going to let you for, for a second here. And this, this, this doesn't scare you. It scares me, right? And God says, I'm just going to open everybody's heart right now. And everybody in the room can see your heart, your desires, your wants, everything about you, what you really believe, what you really are at home, what you really are in the closet. Every, all this, he said, boom, I'm just going to look around. I have to be like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, God, <laughs> enough of that. I'm out. <laughs> Come on. I mean, do you really want everybody to know? No. What if we went around the room and said, man, they're in, his, they're in Word. They're reading and studying and applying it. And they're followers of Christ. And they know what holy is. Amen. You want change in your life? And the Bible says in Ephesians and James, Cephas, which is Peter and John, uh, were known as the pillars of, of the church. My pillar just held something up. And, and if I could be anything in the faith, wouldn't you want to be the pillar in today's society that when everything's crumbling, you say, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to die for this thing. I'm ready to die for it. Uh, man, you can crucify me upside. I mean, really, are we ready to say that? I want to be a pillar of the church. Lasting change comes from lasting words. I don't know whose words you're hearing. If it's an opinion of the... Of, of Hollywood, if it's an opinion of society, if it's an opinion of our leaders, if it's an opinion of our neighbors, those words will not last. But lasting change comes from lasting words. Every head bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around.